Welcome to the 400th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. Stay tuned for my interview with horror writer Hunter Shea, author of the novel Misfits. Stay tuned for the interview. The Reading and Writing Podcast is brought to you by Libro FM. Libro.fm lets you purchase audiobooks directly from your favorite local bookstore. You can pick from more than 185,000 audiobooks, including bestsellers and recommendations from booksellers. You'll get the same audiobooks at the same price as the largest audiobook company out there, but you'll be part of a different story one that supports your local community and your local bookstore. If you're new to audiobooks, they're the perfect way to get more books into your busy life. You can listen during your commute, while doing chores, walking the dog, or just relaxing at home. All you need is a smartphone and the free Libro.fm app. If you already love audiobooks and don't know what to listen to next, check out recommendations and curated lists from people who know audiobooks best, your local bookseller. Here's your special offer from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Get two audiobooks for the price of one today with your first month of membership with the code RWPODCAST at checkout. This offer is only valid for new members in Canada and the U.S., Check out Libro.fm today. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Hunter Shea. I've interviewed Hunter before on episode 133 of the podcast, so go check out that interview as well. Hunter's latest novel is Misfits. Hunter's many novels include Savage Jungle, Loch Ness Revenge, The Jersey Devil, and many others. Hunter, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. I killed episode 133. That's a long time ago. <laughs> yep. Wow. And I'm now on 282 or 283, but it'll be uh, higher once I put this out. That's so. incredible. Kudos to you for keeping at it this long. Thank you. Thank you. Know, you. Since 2009. If someone listening hasn't heard about your novel Misfit yet, how would you describe the novel? It's a period piece, meaning the period is early 90s. So if you grew up loving the grunge era, it's like a little love letter to that. It's about a group of teens who are basically, you know, the, what people in school consider you're the wasteoids, you're the potheads, but they're very different. So they're five very different people who are just united out of friendship more than the need to get high and skip school. And what I did was I folded in this area of the country where I grew up in New York, near Connecticut, and we used to have the legend of the Melonheads. I don't know if you ever heard of them. But they were supposedly a deformed race of people who would live in the woods. And we had, there were certain areas where you couldn't go because the melon heads would come and they would, they were, they would either come and eat you or they would chase you with machetes or they would kidnap you or just throw things at you. So there were great ways to keep little kids out of places they shouldn't be. But it's such a pervasive myth or legend in this area. I, I've always wanted to tackle it. So it's basically, it's these group of teens in the nineties in Connecticut. Uh, and something terrible happens to one of their members, and they decided to take revenge on the person who did it by feeding them to the melon heads, thinking that really melon heads probably aren't real, real, but then they discover that they were quite wrong. And bad things, naturally, it's a Hunter Shea novel, bad things ensue. <laughs> <laughs> so are you publishing this with Flame Tree Press, or are you doing it yourself? Yes, this is Flame Tree. So I've been uh, actually exclusive with them for the last couple of years. They put out just beautiful books. They do hardcover, trade paper, audiobook, ebook, and they do a great job and uh, great distribution. So I'm happy to be part of them and happy to. They, the best thing is, I'm working with Don Diorio, who I've worked with with Sam Hain when I got started. And uh, he just lets your creative flag fly. So he's one of the best editors you can possibly have. Great. Do you remember the original idea that led you to write Misfits? I wanted to... There were two things. Uh, my friend Jack, who is on my Monster Men podcast, I wanted to do something that would entertain him. So it's so funny because when you write, usually I, the successful writers, I think, entertain themselves. You're not going to... You're not doing market research trying to find out what's my biggest bang for the buck. But in this case, I wanted to entertain Jack. And there were a couple of things that 
Connecticut based things that really get him. So it was either going to be Misfits, like the Melon Heads, or it was going to be uh, Dudley Town. And since I was also fascinated by the Melon Heads, I said, all right, we got to explore this. And I looked, and there was really not much fiction on them either. So at least I could break some ground here. And I really wanted to do something set in the 90s. I wanted to just catch that vibe of just, it's similar to now where there's this vibe of distrust, a little despair, a little hopelessness. I remember coming out of college and thinking, there's no jobs here because the economy's crap and the fun days of hair metal are over. And I am really digging this really depressing music. (laughs) So I wanted to recapture that because I lived it. So I might as well talk about it. Sure. You've written a lot of novels. What keeps you coming back to the page or the computer? I think I'm just, I'm addicted. It's, I can't stop. I I just love telling stories and there's more stories to tell than I actually have time to. There was a time, there was a period where I was doing three or four books a year, but now life is different. The job, the day job is different. So I don't have the same amount of time, but I like to, I'm trying to get at least one full novel out on Patreon. i I've been working on a book that people, they read it as soon as it, as soon as I'm done with a chapter, it goes on there. So I've been working almost two years on a book there that people are really digging, but I just love it. It's never become work. Oh, so look, sometimes editing is work. <laughs> the writing process is really never work. I completely enjoy it. And anytime I think to myself, I want to complain. I say, just think back to when you first started and this was your dream and you would smack yourself if you complain about even one iota of what you're doing right now. So I try to keep myself grounded that way. Well, is your writing process the same for each one of your novels? Do you outline extensively or just jump in and see where the story takes you? As uh, author Jason Brantz would say, I'm a pantser. So I'm definitely fly by the seat of your pants. I have a concept. I might have a couple of pages of notes Try at one time I tried pre writing an ending and I wrote five different endings for this book, Torches of the Damned, before I got to it. And when it came time to write the ending, my subconscious created a sixth ending that was unlike any of the other five. So I, I realized when I make plans, they usually don't work out. The only time I've actually done a full outline and I knew the whole book from beginning to end was when I ghost I did a ghost writing gig for an author, and then that's a totally different thing. That's it's part your voice, but you also have to have very much their voice. And there's a formula to what they do. So that was the only time I really sat down and I had that book figured out before I ever wrote the first chapter. But most times, yeah, I just let it rot. Just have fun with it. So tell me about the podcast that you create and record. Oh, Monster Men. Jack and I started that as a video podcast. We started it, I think, 2010. The idea was, I said, hey, I've got this book deal. This is awesome. And Jack and I always, we worked together at the time. We just always would sit around and talk horror, go out to bars, have a few beers, talk about favorite horror movies and things like that. So he said, why don't we just do this? Let's put this thing on. We'll just record. We'll talk for a half an hour or so. We'll put it on there. And maybe it can really help you you know, market your books. And at the time, there were no horror podcasts video-wise that I could think of audio. There was bloody good horror, maybe last podcast on the left, but video, we couldn't find any. So we said, let's just try it. And the fun thing is for us, it's always because we don't get to see she lives. He lives in Connecticut. I live in New York. We don't see each other all the time. So it was always a good excuse. Hey, Jack, come on down. We're going to record four or five episodes a day. There's always lots of alcohol (laughs) right off camera (laughs) and we just have a good time. We're I think we're 150 episodes in and, it's just we're, we're branching out into more now as opposed to him coming to my house and have a couple of beers and talk about some topic. We're, we're interviewing different people and getting their perspective on things. And I think that's bringing in a new and different audience, which has been awesome. And, uh, and what platform do you use? Do you use YouTube? YouTube, yeah. So for that one, we do YouTube. And then for the last three years, we do another show called Final Guys that's with Jason Brandt and now Tim Meyer, author Tim Meyer. And we do horror movie reviews. Basically, we focus on one movie, but we also talk about the things that we've read and watched during the week. We do a lot of ragging on each other. There's a lot of humor in it. We just want to have fun. We don't want to. We don't want to bore people. We, we know there are so many podcasts out there now talking about horror, especially for some reason. This genre just inspires so many fans who are just they can't get enough content. 
whether consuming it or creating it. So we know that you know, we're just another voice out there. So we try to add a little something, a little different, maybe a little more outlandish. We're a lot of fun. I can guarantee you that you'll laugh at least. I'll guarantee at least three laughs an episode. <laughs> <laughs> So what are your earliest memories of reading in books? What's funny, I moved back into the house where I grew up. So it's, those memories are all here. But I remember the first horror novel I ever read was Night Shift by Stephen King. It was on my dad's night table, and he was a huge reader. He would bring home, go to the Strand Bookstore in Manhattan and bring home textbooks. So if he couldn't find something that he was looking for... If he saw a textbook on biology, math, or whatever, he'd bring it home and read it. So he, that kind of got the reading bug in me. But yeah, I remember reading Stephen King, and I asked him, can I read this? And he's, I've been taking to horror movies since you were two, sure. <laughs> I think you'll be fine. <laughs> For the ones who get going when the going gets tough, and the ones who know we're tougher together. For the pathfinders breaking new ground, Granger offers supplies and solutions for every industry as well as fast access to experts and 24-7 customer support. Because we know you have people depending on you, so you can always depend on us. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. And I was just blown away. I went from that, then he showed me his collection of Conan the Barbarian books up in the attic, and H.P. Lovecraft, and Isaac Asimov, and it just went from there. And then... I remember when I discovered Clive Barker and I got to turn him on to Clive Barker. So, ah, here we go. Turn about. You got me into Stephen King. I got you into Clive Barker. So it was the two of us basically feeding off each other. And so what was your path to writing and publishing your first novel? Had you always wanted to be a writer? What was that like? I had dreams of being a writer. I wanted to create. I always wanted to create. But as I went through high school and college, I moved. I was moving more towards the radio side of things. So I actually went to, to college and I got my degree in broadcasting. I wanted to be in radio production or be on air. And it wasn't until I got out of college and I was working a horrendous job in telecom. <laughs> Anyone who <laughs> works in telecommunications knows. And a friend of mine was sitting next to me just writing a book. And at the time, I would think I was 23, 24. I was I was like, what? I, regular people don't write books. Don't, aren't you anointed some special power to write books and you do it in a big study somewhere? And he really, he inspired me. And I started writing some short stories and he was writing short stories. And I just knew I wasn't, I guess I had the four, I, I read enough to realize when I, what I wrote and I would read it back and say, this is not ready. So I took years of writing short stories and novellas before I even tried my hands at a full-length novel. And even that, I did two before I even wrote my first horror novel that I thought, this is something, I, I think I'm ready. And I think when this is done, I can send this out to somebody without being embarrassed. But it took about, I'd say, eight years before I finished that first book where I felt good enough to send it out to an editor. So when you said this is not ready or you felt that this is not ready when you were writing those early short stories and those first two novels, can you think back about that and what wasn't ready and what did you have to improve on or learn for them to be ready and publishable? Yeah, it was, first of all, the my dialogue was always pretty good, but I hadn't found my voice yet. And I, I found I was imitating a lot of different people. And when I when you write it, you're in a zone. When you read it back, you go, oh, that's a derivative of author X and author Y. And just getting the structure and just having it all make coherent sense. I mean, at the beginning, it was just, oh, I've got this great idea. I have this great vampire idea. And I would write this novella about this town taken over by vamp vampires. But when I read it back, I'm like, it's actually boring and it makes no sense. <laughs> it's just, it was just clunky. It was, it's just like, hey, if you want to become like a world-class bodybuilder you you can't go out and compete after a couple of weeks in the gym it takes a lot of work and at least for me that's how it worked i was not one of these hey first book is phenomenal i even think people who they, they talk about their first published book and they get a lot of praise and it, it, they're just amazing i guarantee there's a lot of starts and stops in the dark corners that they don't talk about so 
What writing advice would you offer for listeners who might be at that stage right now and writing their early stories and novels and feeling like maybe it's not ready yet? A, read. Re- and read a lot of good work. And don't be afraid to read a lot of bad books. Well, all right, maybe not a lot. We'll do 80 20, 80 good, 20 bad, because you'll learn sometimes as much from the bad as you will from the good. Because sometimes if you write something that resembles something in a terrible book, you go, all right, that has to go. Beta readers are very important. And I'm not just talking your mom, your wife, your husband, somebody who's impartial to you, but somebody who has a passion for the for the written word, especially good if they have a passion for the genre that you're writing in, and somebody who's not afraid to be bluntly honest with you. Those the beta readers are so important to me still. I just I'm working on a, edits on a book right now, and my beta reader gave me invaluable information about uh, my book. Which, without that, I wish I just would have thought certain sections. Oh, they're fine, but they weren't. So she pointed it out. So it's important to have at least one or two people who you can trust and uh, who are informed and can steer you in the right direction. Are you working on another novel now? Yes. So I'm working for another book for Flame Tree that should be out next year. It's called Faithless. And it is about an Episcopalian priest who is on the phone coming home from a prayer meeting in another town. And he's on the phone with his wife and he's, he hates driving in the rain. And it's a torrential downpour. And he's so fixated on his fear of the rain and driving. And his wife is trying to calm him down. And in the middle of their conversation, he hears the door break open, glass break, and he listens helplessly as his family is murdered on the other end of the line. And he doesn't get there in time. And it's what happens to him in the aftermath of that, where he naturally loses his faith. And there's more to that than than you'd think. So are you planning more monster or cryptid books? Always. (laughs) I just did a uh, panel at Scares That Care. They moved their convention online this past weekend. And I was on a panel with Stephen Graham Jones and a few others about our favorite monster. And one of the questions was, what's a monster that you think hasn't been represented enough in fiction? And I was right away. I said, Mothman. It's (laughs) because... It just seems like a natural progression. I've done the Jersey Devil and the Montauk Monster and the Dober Demon and the Loch Ness Monster and Bigfoot. So Mothman, which to me, if you ever have read the John Keel book of the Mothman Prophecies, which is, it's not a fiction, or we think it's not fiction, but he was a reporter and he was reporting what he was hearing and seeing. It was one of the strangest moments in um, paranormal, cryptid, UFO. You could just put it all in there. Ghosts, it's all... It all happened in that town in West Virginia in uh, the 60s. So I would love to explore that. Either either that Mothman or a modernization of the Mothman. Great. What novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? Oh, I just finished Tomb of Gods by Brian Moreland. He does a lot of research when he writes his novels. And this was like a... Uh, Wilbur Smith meets Michael Crichton meets Stephen King. Real uh, fun adventures set in Egypt and uh, this this uh, um, tomb that's under a mountain. It just it gets crazier and weirder and more fun as it goes along. And that was just a ton of fun. I love that book. And are you still reading short? Are you still writing short stories? In addition to your novels? I do, because I get asked to write, to contribute for anthologies a few times a year. Even when I'm busy, I don't say no. (laughs) Sometimes maybe I need to learn how to say no. (laughs) But yeah, I I put out maybe two or three a year. It's, I would like to do more, but it's just a matter of time. So if I'm trying to do a novel, I'm trying to do a couple of podcasts, I'm writing on Patreon. I'm always doing something. So it's it's just finding the time. But yeah, if I had more time, I'd do more for sure. And so how is Patreon working for you? And is that something that you built around the podcast or is that something you're doing strictly for the fiction? Can you talk about your experience with that so far? Yeah, that's literally just to do for the fiction. What I, The purpose of that originally was I wanted to do this 
book called Clash of the Cryptids. And I wanted to take a lot of the characters that I had written for different publishers and put them all in one book and just have just throw every cryptid into it that I could. How we started it was I would write a few chapters and then we would do the re uh, the reader poll. And I would say, oh, okay, we're, here we are. Here's four different ways it can go. You vote on which way you'd like it to do. So it was one of those pick your own adventure. <laughs> so it was like sometimes it would take a left when I was hoping it would go. But hey, I, the idea was to put myself at the mercy of my patrons. It's actually it's the largest book I've ever written. I feel like it's never going to end, but I know it has to end at some point. We're going on almost 500 pages now. So I'm thinking that's going to end soon. And what I next plan to do, I have a lot of my readers who love my books I've done with Jessica Backman, The Forest of Shadows and Sinister Entity. So they want her to come back. So I did a, a story about her in the Midnight in the Graveyard anthology that also features a story about Robert McCammon. That was that blew me away. That to see my name in the same table of contents as one of my heroes was just I almost dropped the mic and walked away. But yeah, I think what I'm going to do is some Jessica Backman stories on Patreon after that. And maybe that might uh, move me into doing a full book. I could talk to Don over at Flame Tree and maybe we'll do a, a fourth book with her too. And so are you still doing the choose your own adventure style or have you gotten away from that? We, we got so far that no, I can't make any choices. Now I just have to <laughs> barrel ahead to the inevitable end. But that's okay because... They've twisted me in pretzels this entire time. So it's now time for me to bring the grand finale and kill a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> so where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? I just need to go to huntershay.com. Everything is all my links to the, the podcast. All my books are on there. You can get the links to me on Twitter and Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I don't do a lot on Instagram. I take a lot of pictures of books. Not very interesting. Whatever. It's one of those things you have to do. Yep. <laughs> again, we've been again we've been speaking with Hunter Shea, the author of many horror novels. Hunter's latest novel is Misfits. It's available now, so go buy a copy. And Hunter, thanks for doing this interview. Thank you so much, Jeff.